All right, everybody. Are, are they ready back there with the little buttons and things? Excellent. Okay, cool. So, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Harding. Um, I currently uh, work for Canonical on Launchpad. I'll be taking creative criticisms in the hall <laughs> later on. Um, please don't look for me too hard. Um, <clears throat> The title of this talk, obviously, is Starting a Project Right, Set Up an Automation for All. And the reason I want to do this is because I keep finding projects that aren't set up right. So this is my plea to you. See, I, I love, love, love open source, right? I get to go use everybody else's great projects. But then I go find those projects, and they irritate me, and I turn into my Rick's rants. Um, my wife loves it when I go off on little tech rants. She doesn't understand them at all, but she really loves to hear me go off on stuff. But I'm gonna be constructive, because I'm gonna give a talk to all of you so that there's no excuse for me to ever get cranky and angry when I find your awesome library that pisses me off. <laughs> so, and how many people here have uh, software on an open source repository somewhere that I can go find right now? I was thinking a few more, but okay, so most of you guys. So anyways, how many of you guys have Source code and that repository, right? I can get at it. It's not behind some like hidden CVS thing that no one wants to touch with a 10-foot pole. Okay, there's a couple of you, all right? Step one, we'll fix that. Uh, step two, how many of those projects that you guys have up that's open source have tests on them? Yeah, I'm not seeing nearly as many hands. <laughs> I don't like this. All right, and those of you that do have tests, is there a history where I can see, have the tests, the number of tests run increased? Have they failed recently? Have they, is there any kind of like data about the test or can I just run them myself? Yeah, no hands. All right, great. <laughs> of those software projects, how many of them can I go get off the cheese shop, off of PyPI, which is how I'm told I'm supposed to say this now? Again, only about half of you guys had had stuff up there. And then how many of them have a website that's not just my GitHub page? Yeah. See, you're beginning to understand. All right, now, last one. How many of those have documentation? Right? That's not the code. I just want to clarify. Okay, great. All right. And then, what's that? No, doc comments. We need to talk outside. Uh, the, no, <laughs> sorry, you didn't say doc test. If it was doc test, we have to talk outside. Doc comments are okay. Um, and then how many of these things are actually running somewhere? Like if I see you have this cool Django app, I can actually go see it run somewhere. Again, yeah, not as many, but not everyone needs that. But okay, cool. And I'm, what I'm gonna get to here is like all this makes it very easy for me to participate because we all have this open source software. We have this like dream one day, someone's gonna submit a patch, right? <laughs> like, please someone fix my stuff for me. <laughs> um, so what? No, you don't have everything on that list? I'm floored and flabbergasted and I don't understand. So let's try to fix it, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, this is going to be a little interactive -y. We're going to kind of go through a sample little web app. Um, I'm going to do some slides. I'm going to do some code. I'm going to do, we're going to go back and forth. It's going to be a little confusing. If I lose you at any point, just speak up and we'll try to keep up, okay? So we need to create a small Flask website. Before we do anything at all, what we have to make sure we realize is that Python packages have a, a proper layout and structure. And you can just name and create, create a directory, create an init.py and go, yeah, I have a Python package. That's the wrong way to do it. Let's not do it that way. What we're actually gonna do is I'm going to uh, show you the right way to do it. We're gonna use a thing called Modern Package Template. Modern Package Template is a paster template that you say, I wanna create a project called PyOhio. And it goes, awesome, what version is this? What's the description of this? What tags should this project have? Um, and you're gonna go through and you're gonna type all this stuff out. I'm like, who are you? Because I wanna be able to contact you. How about an email address? That'd be handy, right? And the web page we're gonna change later. So this is actually gonna go through and create a lot of stuff for us. And when we look, instead of a directory and an int.py, holy crap, we have like a lot of stuff that makes sense. A readme, a setup.py, a news file. Wow. So notice the first thing I did is remove all the build out stuff. Build out guys, I love you. It's there if you need it, um, but we're not gonna use it today. Um, so just to kind of go through, right? We're gonna have a, pop, a proper Python package. What is awesome about modern package template? From right now, I could run python setup.py uh, dist, uh, sdist, and I will get a built Python package. And I've not written any code yet. So those of you that are not on PyPy, on the PyPI, sorry, 
This fixes it right away for you. Go use this. Okay. Um, so that's, that's step one, is to actually go through. And what's cool is this stuff actually has content. So let's go actually go look. Like, so this is the readme. It says, you should edit me, and you should do stuff. Uh, there's a news file, which is set up to do releases. Right? So what's really kind of cool is you're already set up for success. Because when you go to release your version of your library next time, you're going to go in here, and you're going to actually go like type in a version number and what changed. And when I come look at your library, I'll be able to see in a change log what the hell happened between this year and last year when the last time you pushed a commit was. Right? Oh, I know. See, this is sexy stuff. <laughs> All right, so let's see. So we've got a modern package template. We've got a nice little layout. We're going to move from here. We're all using source control, right? If you're going to push it out, we can assume that. Now where I'm going to get picky now is everything here is going to be centered around Git because Git won. Sorry, hate to break it to you. I went from PZR to Mercurial uh, to Git, found my happy place, and now I work for Launchpad, so I work back on BZR. Happiness is a little tough sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so. What I, wanted, what I want to stress about this, so as I know not everyone's a big Git fan, um, and I'm going to show you a lot of tools centered around it, so it is kind of a requirement for what I'm going to show. There are alternatives. Keep that in mind. I'm, I don't hate you if you're a Mercurial person. Really, I don't. I just want to understand you. That's all. Um, but one thing I will say about Git, people, a lot of people have problems with Git. Um, I had problems. I read the O'Reilly book, which went into like, the details of like, how stuff works underneath. It's amazing when you learn how something is actually working, like why it does the crazy, crazy, you know, bat crazy stuff it does. You actually come to understand and you can use it better. So I encourage you if you're like a person that says, yeah, Git seems nice, like all the hippies use it, but I, I don't really, it doesn't fit my brain. Um, try to spend a little bit of time learning about it and it actually kind of sometimes makes a lot of sense. So I encourage you guys to try that out. So. Um, we're going to be, obviously, if we're using Git, we're going to do things in GitHub. So let's go into our little project here. And uh, notice I've got a little Git directory. Yay, you know, whatever. Um, the point of this is that I've got this repo already set up. So this whole thing is on GitHub. It's going to be a series of branches we're going to check out. You'll watch. And um, feel free to, to play with it or whatnot. So I've already cheated and pushed this to GitHub. Now, the one thing I did want to bring up and remind everybody is that when you go to GitHub and you look at something, there is a README here, which is your first impression. I mean, your first impression is, um, does your code suck? Your second impression is, does your README suck? At least get the README right, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, seriously. I, but, you know, the, the file, you know, make sure that you have your README, that you've got it updated when you push it. Just remember that when you do go to GitHub, the stuff's there. And what's going to be really, really cool about GitHub, one of the things that they've done really, really well, uh, not just their API, but they have this setup of hooks. And we're going to use the heck out of the hooks to make our life very, very, very easy. So step one, we're going to automate this crap. Because if you have like, a library of like, manual stuff you have to remember to do, um, you're doing it wrong. And I've gone through a lot of ways of automating. And recently, one thing Launchpad has taught me is that make files are freaking awesome. Um, I, I don't know like who the super geniuses were that thought all this crap up like decades and decades ago, but I don't know how many guys use Vim, right? It's been around for freaking ever, and like you know they're like, oh, I have a new fancy editor. It's like yeah, but it still can't do what Vim can do. So you know, make files are kind of in this boat. I used to go through and use Fabric and things. Um, make is just. Sweet, and even for things that aren't C files, everyone goes like, "Well, but I'm not coding in C." Like, well, that's okay. You know, we can get around that. So let's uh, let's go check out uh, our make file branch. And basically, what this does is it updates our gives us a make file. Make files are very, very, very scary. I am not going to lie. When I first saw the Launchpad make file, I asked, what language is this? Because um, I didn't recognize it from anything, and I've programmed in a few languages. It was kind of very, very strange. Um, basically, it's got variables. What's cool is variables can do things like shell out. So we're going to create a variable called wd, which is our current working directory. It makes subsequent commands later on very, very handy. The big thing you're going to see is all this kind of stuff, like this all business here. Um, those are what are called targets. A target means do something, right? I want something to happen or exist. Not, that, not as bad as it seems. And then this phony business is just to make, make happy, because there are two kinds of targets, really. There are targets that need to exist, like a file on disk, 
And then there's like, do something. And do something doesn't really exist, so it, you need this phony business to say, this is kind of a fake thing, but go ahead and do whatever it says to do. Where that is really freaking awesome is because um, if it's a, something that does need to exist, make is very intelligent, and it will check and go, does it already exist? Oh, it does. Well, then don't do it again. Right? And what's even better than that is like, let's say you're, I don't know, doing some JavaScript and you want to minimize your JavaScript and you want to be able to actually go through and have that automated with some kind of make command. Make is smart enough to say, you told me to minimize this file. This file depends on the unminified version of the file. Now yesterday, I did this, I did, I minified this for you. And that file has not changed since yesterday, the dependent one, the, the original non-minified. So I don't need to minify this again for you right now. That is badass. And that's where make files get over things like Fabric, where you can tell it to run a command over and over and over again, but the ability for a make file to be smart and go, do I need to do this, yes or no, and actually execute with that, um, it just makes it really, really sweet. So we're Python devs, so we're gonna need a few things. We're gonna need virtual ems, because everyone here uses virtual ems, right? Or build out, you guys are okay. We'll, we'll let it go. Um, I, we're gonna need, uh, I, I cheat, the way I say is a virtual inf there or not is by checking to see if the file bin python exists. Um, notice this is not a phony. This actually, if this exists, it runs a virtual inf command. If it doesn't exist, it runs virtual inf this directory, right? See, ah, not as scary as it seems. Um, anything that we do, we wanna be able to clean up. So if I create a virtual inf and I wanna like just blow it away and start back from scratch my build process, I wanna be able to clean my virtual inf. Yeah, right, not too scary. Um, and then because we have proper Python packages, right, because we use uh, the modern package template, we want to be able to actually run this setup.py develop command. I'm sure we've all used that in our little virtual inf in order to be able to work on stuff and test your scripts and all that stuff. Um, this is like a real big hacky cheat and I should do it a different way, but basically, um, I'd say that you know the, the develop command depends on this file being here. This file is put here by running this command. So again, when I say make develop, it'll go, oh, I depend on this. Does this already exist? Yes, then don't run the command. We're already set. So this is kind of nice for that. And then I've got a clean all down here where we actually go through. And, and one thing I, I add in here is if we ever do like a, a, a setup.py uh, generate our distribution file, we want to just remove that whole directory. That's part of just, just blow everything away from scratch. Basically like a fresh git clone. So we're going to use this as we move along to automate the things we do because automation is good and no automation is bad. And here's 30 lines that does some decent automation for us, right? So let's just kind of, you know, demonstrate. Uh, I don't have a virtual env, so let's make vmf. Woo! Awesome, I have vm stuff. And then let's just, you know, for the hell of it. Uh, I, this is going well. Uh, Tab complete, save me. Um, all right, and, and they're all gone again, right? So we want repetitive, we want automation, we, we like this stuff, it's good. Um, and I definitely recommend, there's an O'Reilly book, again, on Makefile. I'm not on O'Reilly Shrill, I promise. I just, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a happy user. Uh, on Make stuff, I only had to get to about 25% of the book before I could actually be productive. So I actually still don't know what's in the second half of that book because it got really, really scary. So <laughs> you, when, you, when you pick up the book, don't feel like, don't jump to the end. Don't start there. That's bad. <laughs> you will not keep going. So tests. All right, let's keep the preaching going. Uh, tests, you need to have tests. Everyone should have tests. So let's check out our test directory. And what we're gonna see is I basically did is in our little thing, we're gonna add, oh, refresh, you stupid command. Um, that's, uh, what is it called now? Shoot, P something, P complete or P control. Control P, uh, that, it's a Vim plugin, very, very awesome. If you don't use it, use it. Um, it'll make your life nice and easy. So basically, all we're gonna do is, is um, we're gonna make sure that we have a, a quick test using unit tests that imports our library and runs uh, that we have uh, our little thing outputs hello world. I guess we should look at that file, shouldn't we? Um, modern package template, uh, modern package template automatically defines a little hello world main for you. Um, what's really cool, is that in the setup.py, it starts out with an entry point for you so that just by having this package, when I do a, a make develop, because we're using our make commands to automate crap so we don't have to remember it, 
Um, it actually sets up this PyOhio main thing for us. So I guess we should probably, uh, let's see, make our virtual env, make develop, and now I should be able to, oh, uh, let's activate it. Um, Right, PyOhio, yeah, 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 our thing's there, right? We should cover this part first before we test it, I imagine. Um, although if we're doing test TDD, we shouldn't. But anyways, the whole point is that we have hello world here and that we have a test file da, 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 that tests that this happens, right? And so because we have tests, the first thing we want to do is to run our tests and that means we're going to automate things because test running is an automated feature. So um, notice we, we basically add in a few more things for our make file. One of the things I'm going to use um, nose for my test running, which means that I need to have nose in my system in order for this to work, which means I need a make command to install dependencies. And in order to install, install dependencies, we're actually just going to run a pip install in our requirements.txt. You can get fancy with this stuff uh, if it's in your setup.py and your test requires and all this kind of stuff. I'm just keeping this simple for demonstration purposes. Uh, and then this is the actual command we will run in order to run our tests. So since we have this, and notice that the test command depends on nose, which depends on dependencies, which means I've not yet installed nose. But if I do make test, it goes, I need nose. And just crap automatically happens. Now, if I'm a user of your tool, your library, your web app, and you tell me run make tests and the test shall run, uh, I like this because I don't have to know, well, they only run if you have the proper dependencies and you're running the right command with the right arguments and the right whatever, right? This is where the make file is sweet. Um, I've got an app that I used to be like a 12-step process, you know, like a program in order to be able to install it. And now it's like git clone and make install. And it does like, it runs for 20 minutes. But when it's done, everything's just ready to go. What's up? How do you make, how would you make So uh, you would just add that as a, as, a, as a thing here, right? So I would say it depends on nose and um, vmf. Because vmf is a target that I've got in the system here. So if I did this, so yeah, let, now let's try this, right? Let's on the fly, what's, what could possibly go wrong? Um, <laughs> all right, so I've got no directory. All right, so now let's try this. Make test. Oh! See, and it failed because I've got them in the wrong order. Um, because before you can do nose, you need depths. Before you can do depths, you need a virtual env. So this is actually how this should work, right? See, you're making me think on my feet, and this is no good. Anyway, there we go, virtual env. Now we're getting nose, we're gonna run our tests, voila, right? So the chaining and stuff is very, very cool, and, and it should be done better from the start. Thanks for pointing out flaws in my presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so we've got tests. But now, the most important thing, we must run our freaking tests. They must run often. And in order to run them often, people are going to go, but I don't want to set up Jenkins. It's Java, and it's expensive, and yada, yada. There's this really kind of cool thing out there called Travis CI. And Travis CI says, hey, we're Rock. And so if you're an open source project, we will automatically run your tests for you in our own little build environment, virtual environments and all. And uh, life will be good and happy. And I was like, hey, I like free stuff. Um, so let's update. Oh, no, I changed my file. Ah. Oh, go away. See, you're really messing me up now. Um, all right, so the only thing that I had to change for this is you have to add a little YAML file, right? And this, this is where Travis, this is what's cool. This is free. Um, it's doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And not only does it do what you're supposed to be doing, it lets you do things like run your tests in different Python versions. It lets you say, what needs to happen before these tests actually run? Well, I need my requirements. Um, what is the actual command to run in order to run the tests? And I'm like, well, you should probably run this command right here, right? I do this, I put it in my code, which I hate doing. I do hate having miscellaneous crap in the code base, but for this, I will forgive them because it's very, very awesome. And now, whenever I push uh, a change, do, 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 oh, I need to sign in. Don't look, don't look. Um, oh, I'm signed in already, awesome. All right, so, um, oh shoot, I'm red. This is, this will never do. Um, and I don't need to edit it. And this doesn't work well. Uh, my one complaint is they, they don't fit well on uh, not then 
perfect width screens. But basically what you can see is, is that as I've worked on this presentation, I've had the test passing twice. Um, this isn't good. Uh, but anyways, the <laughs> see, now as a user, if I go to use your tool, I want to see this. <laughs> your crap's broken. I don't want to use it. <laughs> right? So um, but this is very, very handy, though. I mean, how many times do you have a user that's like, oh, I pulled down your code, I tried to run, and I hit this bug? Yeah, that's a known bug, right? Well, I didn't know it. I didn't see it in the bug listing. Yeah, but if the tests were always running and they showed failing, you could be like, yeah, see, it's failing there. If you would love to submit a patch to get those red to green, I would really love you. Um, but, you know, that doesn't happen all that often. Anyways, the point here, though, is that they automatically run your tests. You can see some other things that I run on here, um, a B-readability uh, library thing. Uh, here we go. They weren't loading all at first. So let's see, I, I do have tests to pass. Um, but one thing that's cool, and I kind of left this here on purpose, is that um, if you go look, jeez, uh, go away. Um, you can see that my tests are passing under 2. Th behind the thing, 2.7 but they fail on 2.6. And I'm like, well, that's strange. What the heck? Why did it not pass on 2.6? And you go look at your nice little build. La, 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 la. And somewhere down here it goes, oh, no module name arg parse. Frick, I forgot. Arg parse didn't come along until 2.7. Now see, on my system, I only have 2.7. But a user who is on some ancient fedora piece of crap comes along <laughs> and wants to use my tool. And I'm like, dude, it doesn't work. Like, oh, well, because you don't have arg parse. So you know what? Submit a patch to my setup.py that conditionally requires you know, arg parse, and we'll be happy again. So anyways, um, the point here is Travis is cool. It will run your test for you automatically. If you donate to them, which everyone should, they will actually give you the feature where if anyone does a pull request to your tool, it will actually run the tests on it to make sure that a pull request didn't break any tests for you before you merge their pull requests. Now, that doesn't mean that they actually added a good test or that they didn't add something that isn't tested or any of that kind of you know conditions and all that apply. But it's pretty badass. Travis, folks, love you guys. Um, so let's see where, where we're at. This is what we want. We want source code. We got it. We got tests. We got it. We got test history. This is what I meant by the history, that I can see your stuff's normally broken. It's OK. Um, <laughs> next up, we need to get to Pi. Uh, to, to, I can't say Pi PI. I don't know why. I think you have to be like from England or something to say it right. Um, so let's check that one out. Um, the Pi PI thing is really kind of easy because all it really is is um, modern package template took care of us. So all we did is we're going to add some blocks to our make file. We're going to add a build command that will generate a source disk file for us. We're going to have upload because, hey, if you're going to actually like have a distribution, you might as well put it somewhere where people can get to it. Um, and then this is one trick that I, don't, I, I, I use just because um, you need to keep your version up to date, right? People version your stuff, please. Uh, the whole like it works in GitHub, like I don't know, like you know how often that was, or and all this stuff. Like actually, do try to do like real versions, um, even if they're like you know one to one billion, but you increment so I can at least pick one and grab it. Um, but in order to do that, you're going to need to keep a version string. Your setup.py has version in it. Um, my init script has it because I, you know, you like let's say you have a command line client. I expect to have whatever command line tool you supply, dash dash version. It just should be there. Please add that to all your, arg parse should do that like by default. Like it should throw an exception. No version implemented, you know, and come back to you. Um, and then we talked about the news.txt because you're going to document in your change log what the hell happened between the last version and this version. So this is a cool shortcut. Like whenever I do like make version update, it then opens up all these files for me. Um, and because make is very shell centric, I can just say editor. And if you're an Emacs fan, this will still work. So, you know, you guys, I take care of you, right? So, um, anyways, there's not much to this. I mean, it's really kind of, you know, uh, what did I call it? Build. Make build. There we go. Uh, so now I've got uh, a dist directory that has my .tar.gz, right? So again, automation is good because we're going to do lots and lots of releases frequently with lots of updates and fixes and people that merge stuff in and all that, and we've got it automated with make, and so we're all happy. Okay? Oh yeah, I was supposed to go to this slide. Um, next up, website. And I'm going to distinguish between this. Um, 
Uh, your website is your marketing arm of your, of your little business here. Um, it's going to tell me like why I should use this thing, like what is it actually good at, and has pretty pictures if it's a, if it's an actual like web app. I want to see a screenshot of the damn thing, you know, put this stuff up here. And again, you're like, well, but I've got to go find like a WordPress account or I got to do something that's all hard and complicated. I'm like, no, really it's not. GitHub has this thing called GitHub Pages. And what we can do, 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 do is actually go in and say, you know what, I've got this project. And where's my admin button? Really? Am I? I'm just blind? Down a little. They, what are the big tabs? Ah, <laughs> admin. When did they, I swear I just had this. Um, <laughs> They actually have a button in this mysterious admin page that no one can find, um, except everyone in the audience. Um, that's called GitHub Pages. And what's cool is they actually have like this automatic generator where you go through and say, hey, um, let me go ahead and pull in your readme, and we'll start with that. Um, which, again, your readme is not your website, right? Your readme needs to be, how do I install it? How do I run the tests? Um, and maybe the change log of what's changed recently, right? The readme short, sweet, you know, article, you know, Something you stick into classifies, right? You're, you know, the website is actually images and pretty and colors, and you know maybe some designer friend of yours helped you out, or maybe it, they didn't, so it, it looks very ugly. But still, you know, you, you need to have it. And it, you, the Google tracking idea is kind of cool because you want to know how many people came to this page and looked at my library and decided either to use it or not to use it, right? And maybe you need to like give them some more info so that they will use it. Um, anyway, so this is kind of cool because they have all these fancy little layouts that work out of the box. And you say, publish. And they're like, yes, sir. We're going to go ahead and put this here. Um, and it's not generated yet. But whenever their queue gets through and actually generates, um, you'll actually get a, a GitHub pages, and, you know, a nice little website layout. I encourage you to use that. Um, pick something, play with it. The thing I'm going to like, classify, I'm going to conditionally go, eh. I got angry at them because no, that wasn't there. Um, I got angry at them because I went to use this, and they're like, sweet, use Markdown, and we'll generate HTML for you. And I thought, sweet, I like to use non-HTML you know, non and, and have pretty stuff come out. Except that when I was done, I couldn't find the Markdown file. And I'm like, but I want to edit my content. And they're like, well, edit the HTML. And well, no, no, the whole point was I don't want to edit HTML. <laughs> so when I hit this, and maybe I'm using it wrong, because I did ask on Twitter, like, am I using it wrong? And no one replied. But from what I could find is you can submit Markdown um, in order to get the page generated. But once you do that, the original Markdown file is gone. So I'm sure you could like stick it in you know, your Git repository and actually keep it around and try to maintain it or whatnot. But I was kind of cranky that they didn't just automatically keep my Markdown for me. So uh, very angry. All right, now documentation is next. Documentation is not a website. Right? You're not going to sell me on the 12 different ways you can host a Django app, right? But if you have a Django app, it would be awesome if in your documentation you had, if you're an Nginx user, do this. If you're a Apache user, do this. If you're some kind of lighty weirdo, you can actually serve it doing this. You know? And so um, documentation should be very verbose. Should feel free to be as technical as you want to be, right? I am you know, really looking forward to some great technical documentation so that I don't have to go read your source code and then have to critique it. Um, and then, again, your history stuff should be in, in, your, doc in your documentation. I want a change log. I want to know that we went from having no features and sucking to being rock awesome and it's all pretty now. Um, and then, like I said, you know, this is where you drop like very verbose hints, tips, uh, FAQs, things you might run into. You know, some dude on Solaris, you know, ancient, tried to use this and he hit this bug, but he told us this is how he worked around it. You might be interested in that if you're a Solaris user or whatever, right? So, in order to do docs correctly, there's only one true way, because we're Python developers, and that is to use Sphinx. Sphinx has like a little command, Sphinx. Oh, son of a chipmunk. Um, auto, like, you know, generate some default docs for you. And so we'll go look at uh, refresh. It gives you, you know, a nice little refresher text, you know, thing to go through and add some, add some documentation to. That's great. Again, I'm going to notice something here. Oh, no, wrong make file. Uh, we want to build our docs frequently, often, and whenever we want to. Therefore, we use make again. Isn't this cool? So, basically, we use make to automate the generation of our docs. We 
actually have a nice shortcut because we love our users that does, uh, not just uh, does a docs, and this is really bad. This should not be upload, it should be open. But if I change it, Git will complain later. So anyways, this pretend that says docs open. Um, you can actually open the generated docs for them, right? So notice that it depends on docs. So what it'll do is first it'll build them, and then it will use whatever your default browser is to open the index page, and then you can go through them and look at them locally, right? So you know this is really kind of cool and awesome. You have automatic opening of the docs. However, what's really cool and awesome is to go back into our project and go find that stupid hidden admin button. And this is where the webhooks come in, because there's this great service called Read the Docs, and I didn't get it at first. I'm like, I don't understand. What are you guys talking about? Read the Docs. I have Docs. I, I put them up. It's very easy. I R-sync. I don't, I don't understand. Um, but then I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? They, they, they convinced me that this is cool, because um, one, you can have multiple versions of your Docs, right? You can have it for tags, for branches you've got. And it will generate, read the docs, will generate your documentation for you for all of those things if you, if you ask it to. So let's say you've got version 0.3 and you just push out a big major change called 0.4. You've got some people that are still on old Solaris and can't upgrade to 0.4. So they want to see the, the three docs. But all the new cool kids, they want to see the four docs, right? So um, it allows you to do that automatically. And if I do that myself, that's a little bit more of a pain in the neck, right? It automatically does it. Think of it like as continuous integration for your docs. And then I was sold. I'm like, oh, I like continuous integration. Doing that for my docs must be super cool. Um, and so whenever you push a change, your docs are updated. What's awesome about this is GitHub has this cool thing where someone who doesn't know how to code or even how to use Git can go to the website and look at your docs page. And they can edit it straight in the web UI. And they can submit a pull request from that. And you see that. So what you do is you go, oh, yeah, I did have a major typo there. Let me go ahead and accept this merge proposal or pull request or whatever the heck they call it. And it will automatically do it. Git will say, you had a change. And then read the docs goes, oh, hey, something changed. Let me update your docs for you. And I didn't have to touch anything, really. I hit one little button that says, yes, accept this pull request. And my docs are updated and users love me. Right? So the automated builds is really, really cool. So you really got to think about it as a continuous integration for your docs and use read the docs. Again, a free service, something that I think some companies sponsor and donate to. I don't know if you can donate to. I should send them a check to say thank you because I love you guys. So, woo, we're getting down this list. Um, and I'm making this sound harder than it is because I'm exasperated up here. Uh, this is really easy stuff. And what I hope to get across is that, look, you just got docs, multiple versions, pushed out automatically from Git without any work. So there's no excuse for you to not have up-to-date docs on a website somewhere that I can access, right? So next up, we need to actually run this stuff. And so if we're going to run something, we need something more than Hello World. Um, we need an actual application of some sort. Uh, so let's go grab our file. Ooh. Well, that's not good. There we go. That looks better. Um, so we're going to do a little Flask app. The only reason we're doing Flask is just because, A, it's a web thing. It's very easy. Um, it has adds a dependency we can use, yada, yada. And, and all we're going to do, though, is, is say, hello, PyOhio. It's nothing, nothing really to it, right? So Heroku was pretty sweet because, A, they have a free, well, first they're cool because they can host about anything. If you have a Django app, if you've got a Pyramid app, if you've got a Flask app, if you've got a WSGREF app, you can basically run it on Heroku. And you don't have to deal with setting up a server, setting up Apache or Nginx, and, and, and setting up you know, proxy pass and all this kind of business. You just say, Heroku, go, go run my stuff, please. And they go through, yeah, sure, no problem. Right? So in order for them to do that, uh, you've got to tell them, how in the world do you run this thing? Right? And so this is a um, little WSGI app, Flask app. What we do is we add this file called a proc file. Again, we're putting dirty files into our source code repository. I, I generally don't like this, but Heroku is awesome, so I forgive them. Um, we're going to run it with uh, G Unicorn. We're going to run our app. And they actually tell you what port to run because they do all the proxying business behind. So you just, just trust them, copy and paste this out of their docs. Their docs are actually pretty good. And uh, we're going to run with three workers. And we're actually run our app. So we did that. We signed up for a Heroku account and all that kind of stuff. That's all I really did. Um, you need to install what's called the Heroku tool belt, basically a package that you install in your system that gives you a Heroku command line client command thing. Um, the one thing that I don't like about this is that modern package template sticks all your code inside a directory called source. 
when I tried to run this with Heroku, I had to move my, uh, my uh, Python app up a level get, to get out of the source directory. Because you notice that um, command here says, look for a package PyOhio. Ooh, that's way up there. Um, and if you have source slash PyOhio, um, Heroku can't find it, because it, source is not technically a Python package. It won't look in there. So you have to move things up a level, which means moving all my make command targets and all that kind of BS and grumble, grumble. But again, it's awesome, so I forgive them for it. Um, but I do need to, I, and one day it would be cool if it would actually like, you know, um, set up that Py, install your app, and have it in the namespace or whatever uh, to be able to work. So we're going to fire it up. This is going to be a series of commands. Unfortunately, in order to test that this actually worked and that my code was right, I had to actually already go through and do it. But we're going to actually go through, and, and I think we can actually walk through part of this here. So you actually, Heroku is a command. You log in. It's going to ask you what's your username, what's your password, and go, OK, boom. I got an app for you. Um, it supplies this thing called Foreman, which is like a local testing environment that will start your app up kind of like Heroku does. So you can kind of see, like, is my stuff working? Is my proc file good? Or will it blow up and burn? You know, all this kind of stuff. So Foreman's kind of cool for testing. Um, so now what we're going to do, this is to give me nice hints, right? So we're on this Heroku branch. We've got our changes to our code. We've got our proc file. Um, however, we never deploy from a branch, right? So what we want to do is merge our Heroku code in here. So yeah, we've, we've done a little bit of work since we started this thing. And after we do that, we're going to create our project. So Heroku create Pi Ohio. And it says, yes, sir, I have added it based on this Git repository down here. So what's going to be really sweet is what we're going to do to deploy our app is actually just a Git push. And that's going to be awesome. So, of course, we don't git push manually, because that's manual. <clears throat> what we do do is we add make file commands. Yay! Everyone's favorite. Um, it's phony because there is no file on disk. Uh, people can't see it. Let's move it up. Right? So all this is going to do is um, the Heroku tool belt thing added a new remote. If you know about Git, you've got, you can actually have multiple remotes. Normally everyone has one. You like Git push origin, whatever the name of the branch is. You can actually have multiple. And so Heroku adds one. Heroku. So what we're going to do is we're going to git push to Heroku, our master branch. And uh, we have a foreman one here just for testing, right? So in order for me to deploy this app, or right, we don't do that. We do make Heroku. Notice tab completion and make file targets. It's really awesome. ZSH, very cool. Um, Anyways, so it's going to go through and do this for us. And this is going to take a second. So while this is running, um, it's going to create a virtual environment. It's going to grab our app. It's going to git clone it. Um, what I love about this, this is so freaking easy to deploy that I found on anything that I have on Heroku, I am more than five times as likely to go ahead and push small changes out to production rather than bank them up over time. And so um, if Travis CI ever like really wanted my money, what they would do is, is they would say, hey, if the test pass, let me go ahead and automatically push that to Heroku for you and deploy. Because then I would be like, a you know, I'd have that super like big company continuous integration pipeline that open source junkie devs like you, know, you and I just kind of go, yeah, that's nice, but it's work. Um, and it should be almost done. Oh, a crap ton. They support like even Scala, Clojure-y kind of things. But the, the big thing, they started out as Ruby. They did Ruby to Python. It's like anything you can give like that web command to run, it'll almost run. Um, so definitely check them out. They've got a really good, they're very good with the community. You can ask them questions. Um, I don't suppose Kenneth is in here, is he? They've got, well, they've got flexible containers. So if they don't have something, if you want to run it, you yeah, the build packs. You can create your own custom build packs. People have done some of that stuff. That's like over my head still at the moment. So I just know it exists if I need it. But I'm a Python dev, and they make me happy. Um, what's that? Oh, sorry. Can I repeat question? The question was, um, what other languages does Heroku support? And I basically said a ton. And if they don't support it, you can write your own build pack, which will enable it to be supported. Um, and I just don't know everything that's involved with that. So here we go. We pushed our branch master up. And notice that it gave me a nice little URL. So let's go hit that URL. Oh, hello, PyOhio. You guys rock. And because we're doing this and we really want to be happy, what we're going to actually do is uh, 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 
do do do. Let's just make sure. All right. So we never ever commit to master. Don't ever do that. Um, but basically, this is what it was, right? I changed my code. I should have run my test, which would have broke because I changed what it said, and it didn't. Uh, but anyways, aside from all the things I'm doing completely wrong, um, the point here is that now when I go reload my app, which takes a second for the load here, um, we have updated source code, right? Uh, updated live deployed app. Uh, the one thing I will note, I use this for an, an API endpoint thing that I use. Um, if you're on the free tier, as in you're only, you're only paying for one web worker, what they will do is, is if your app's been idle for like an hour or so, they'll actually shut it down. And so, you know, like when you first start your app, there's a second while the Python modules load up and all that kind of business. Um, that happens then at, if on the first request after an idle time. So like you saw there, it took a second for that to kind of load up. If I, you know, if I do it again, you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, it's very fast. But when it goes down into idle mode and back out, it will give you a noticeable second or two lag. So like I wouldn't run my Amazon company competitor on here on the free tier because people would be like, hey, your page is too damn slow, right? But it's free for uh, stuff and to start out with, and it's very awesome and it makes life very easy. Um, oh, I forgot that we're supposed to scale it out, but I already done that earlier. So this is where you tell it how many workers to run. If you run more than one, they don't shut down, but then you, you pay the money, which you should all do, right? So there's the URL for that. So basically what I wanted to kind of go through is look at, everything here was really, really fairly easy. Like none of the branches that we switched between was more than 10 or 12 lines of code to actually get running. And if you use the right tools, you're gonna to make your stuff very easy for me to want to participate in. You're gonna give me source code. You're gonna make it easy for me to shove you that pull request that everybody dreams of having one day. You're gonna give me these docs that are up to date and automatically built that I just love as a user, right? You're gonna give me a readme file because it's used on the cheese shop site. It's used on your GitHub page. You're gonna actually make it sensible and, and not five miles long, but give me what I need to know when I first start out. You're gonna give me a Python package so I don't have to package it and figure out how to get it somewhere and all this kind of crap. And you're gonna run your tests. because I'm gonna go look and go look. Oh look, his tests have passed every commit for the last month. Um, and you have commits, so this is good. And then you're gonna let me go look at your app. Your Django app's gonna, I can go poke at it and maybe create a demo account or, or at least see that it does in fact load and run and that mine doesn't work because I did something stupid, not because your guys' code's broken, right? And Heroku's providing us that. So I, what I really wanna say is, is that there's, it's a great time to be a developer because there are a number of great tools provided by really kind of, I, I'm, I'm fanboys of the companies because they just, you know, to do this manually yourself can be done and I encourage you to do it. However, I wanna stress is that this was so easy thanks to these guys that are just rocking it up. So I definitely encourage you guys to check them out and do stuff. So thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I don't know, but I know that the guy who, who did that um, is, is, would love to have help and contributors. And so like, this, it would be really nice if maybe he moved the search directory out of the way, right? So that the stuff like Heroku worked out of the box. And I would encourage you guys, if you're interested in this kind of thing, to participate in the modern package template and kind of get that going. If you need something slightly different, um, paster scales me, scares me a little bit, but maybe you're a paster you know, guru and you can create your own templates. I, I think the idea is to kind of encourage that this whole automated of how things are laid out is, is worth your time and effort for sure. Yeah. What terminal app are you using? It's uh, URXVT. Oh, sorry. What terminal app am I using? I'm using URXVT. Um, like I said, I went to make files. Evidently, I am just have a thing for old school tech. So I have old terminal stuff, old editors, old uh, make files. Yeah. Early on, uh, you were talking away from the computer, and yet uh, you saw a bunch of commands executing automatically. Uh, now, was that a video? A no. Automatically executing live. I, I used a, 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 a terminal recorder tool called TTYREC, and you basically say TTYREC, and it starts watching whatever you do. And so you have to practice a ton because you're going to make a ton of mistakes and typos, like someone's over your shoulder. And then you use a, a tool called TTY Play, where you can then feed it how fast you want it to come back. So notice I fed it back at 1.5 times the speed I recorded it at, just for this kind of thing. But yeah, that was kind of handy for that. Um, however, one thing to note, I had to redo it right before the talk because on the smaller size of the presentation 
display, um, it broke. And I had to re-record it at the right resolution that I was going to present it at. So <laughs> check that. Any other questions for anything? Um, if you guys need me, I'm around all weekend. I'll be at the Sprints, sprinting on my bookmark app, Bookie, which is all kind of cool. And um, I would hope to see you guys around. Enjoy the conference.